This has been one day that's really been particularly touching to be in worship. Matt, thanks for some great singing. And Thomas, some great thoughts for the Lord's Supper. I, he's, that's a, a, the issue he dealt with is something I've always wondered about, and I think he did a beautiful job of covering that. Put some thought and time into that. And I'm so grateful when someone does that, and I become a beneficiary of their work. And it's been great to have been here. Uh, I hope that you have plans to be here next week. As I said last time, the Heritage Banquet comes after church. So immediately after church, those of you 55 and older or married to somebody 55 and older uh, will, will stay and be with us for a meal and some entertainment. It's going to be some fun. We at Valley just like to have some fun like that and, and entertain and serve our older folks and just let them know how much they're appreciated. And um, being Hee Haw, that tells you something about the quality of the entertainment, you know. Uh, so just 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 know what Hee Haw is, okay? Just know what Hee Haw is. That's important. We're in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 will be there. And, uh, and, and 1 Corinthians, that section for the whole morning. So go ahead and make your way over there if you will. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. With just one point of your finger, tell me where Aiden is. Yeah, you all knew it. Okay, I was just making sure you knew. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. This morning we're going to talk about, we've been doing this series sporadically all year long, just kind of different segments. And this morning we're going to be talking about something uh, to add to our list. The first thing we talked about was this, that at the Valley View Church of Christ, the Bible is our sole source of authority. We've talked about that. That is our guiding force for everything we do. We've talked about male spiritual leadership as being God's created and recreated intent for us and that's what we practice here the Lord's Supper is a central feature of worship every week when we gather we've already done that and that is a very precious time to us and something we think until the Lord comes we do and baptism is an essential response that we make for the salvation God wants to give us. These are things we've talked about uh, throughout the year. We've got a few left. And today we're going to talk about one that you can't miss because we stress it all the time. Worship, public worship, that it is a central, it's a very big emphasis here. And you can tell from that list that w the Bible guides what we're going to do, just like it does everything else. Males will be the ones leading. That's just how God has designed it. We've talked about that already. So you know these things, but there's something else you need to know. There's some more we need to talk about when it comes to our worship here. How do we decide what we do in a worship service? If you're on Sunday morning flipping through your TV, you're going to find all sorts of varieties and flavors of worship. And you're going to notice just by just by the architecture of the building that things are different. Some people back behind the preacher have several chairs back here and that's where a chorus gathers and they, they sing or they perform back there. Some will have solo singers. We have some great singers here, but they stay in their pew and they join their voices with everybody else's. Kind of that's, that's kind of what we do here. We'll be talking more about that at a later time. You'll notice we don't have instrumental music, which we'll deal with in probably October or November when we talk about that particular part. Our worship doesn't fluctuate much. It pretty much stays the same. And some people, it drives them crazy. I mean, I want to do something a little different every once in a while. I get that. In the New Testament, there's no real clear one-spot instruction. It's not like you look to the book of Ephesians and there's an order of worship for how Paul worshipped in Ephesus. There's nothing like that. You go through the Gospels when Jesus was here or the Acts of the Apostles when, when you see what they did in the early church, there's no discussion, lengthy discussion of what exactly a first century worship service looked like. Seems like that'd be nice. And there are some people then that go to the opposite extreme and say, you know what, we don't know anything about what they did. That's not exactly true. 
The New Testament letters were correctives. They were mistakes. They were blunders the churches were making. An apostle would take the story of Jesus and, and apply a, a corrective through a letter and send it to that church to help them figure out what, what's wrong and how to be more faithful to the gospel. Well, Paul was doing that to Corinth, and what Corinth was doing is their church worship service had gone just totally haywire. They got everything wrong. The wheels on the bus came off, and it was just a mess. And Paul knew about this. He may have witnessed some of it, but he certainly heard about it. And he says, I wanna, I, I've got I've to write to you guys about your worship service because this is such a big thing that we do that I want to apply a corrective to you. And remember, it's not just a Cor Corinthian correction. This is what he wrote. He says two or three times. This is what I tell all the churches. So this is like his application of truth to the, to the Christian worship proper. This is how Christians are supposed to worship when they're people of truth. And that's what he starts in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. From chapter 11 through the first part of chapter 16, it's all about worship stuff. And this is where we go. Observation number one. It's a very short one because we've already talked about it. Chapter 11, the first part says male spiritual leadership is how you're supposed to operate in the church. Now, there's a lot of weird stuff in this first part of chapter 11 about head coverings and what do you make of all that? And some of that gets really weird. And we could spend for half a day on that, but I don't think you'll be with me for half a day. So we're going to skip that. And I'm going to say the main point is verse 3. It's the principle that the rest of it is expressing. And here's the point. But I want you to understand the head of every man is Christ. The head of a wife or a woman is a husband. The head of Christ is God. And I want that to be reflected in words he says I want proper headship reflected in your worship and the way you do that is men do the leading of the worship we do not choose this and we don't necessarily understand why it's this way but we are not li at liberty the elders in this church the preacher at this church none of us are at liberty to change this no matter what culture says so I've just got to say observation number one from the first part of chapter 11 is that we practice male spiritual leadership when it comes to the church. Observation number two begins at verse 17 when he says to them, guys, the way you're doing the Lord's Supper is terrible. It's doing harm. It's individualistic. You're all coming together and you're taking the Lord's Supper and you're eating other things with it, right? And you're, and you're just looking at yourself. You're not thinking of each other. I hate the way you're doing the Lord's Supper and I just assume you forget it, except that you shouldn't. The Lord's Supper is critical and he corrects them. You guys not to think about each other. You got to consider each other when you take it. We've already dealt with this, so I'm not going to spend much time. But that's 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Observation number three comes from chapters 12 through 14. And it sets mostly in verse chapter 14. It's full of some complicated matters. Each believer in the church has a spiritual gift. Each one of you has one at least. And you're supposed to discern what that spiritual gift is and you're to use it for the building up of the church. Some of that is done outside the worship service proper, but some of it in the first century was done right there in the worship service. Their worship service must have been quite interesting because they did not have the New Testament. They mostly didn't even have a copies of the Old Testament. And so in worship, when you're trying to talk about what God's will for your life is, you're somewhat limited in what, what access you have to that will. And so what God did is he provided these miraculous gifts of called prophecy. A prophet would stand up. It's nothing more fancy than this. In the middle of this worship service, the prophet would stand up and say, I have a word from God. And he would tell the church a word from God. And that was their prophecy. They didn't have access to anything else. God miraculously provided that. That would have been cool, right? I think so. And then there's this other weird thing he did. He gave some of them the ability to speak in different languages. And they would stand up in the midst of the assembly and they would just say something in a foreign tongue. And some people probably present understood it in their own tongue because there's plenty of languages in Corinth, but most of them didn't. So someone then stood up beside that person, maybe the same person sometimes, and they would interpret that tongue. It became a, a two-part prophecy is really what that did. 
And a lot of those people were really enamored with the tongue speaking. It's pretty neat to speak in a language you never studied. I think that would be fascinating. Actually, today, if that happened, I'd be terrified and I would run for my life, to be honest with you, if you've ever been to a service like this. That's their thing. That's their worship service. Now, however, we have a written access, objectively, to the words God wants us to know in the New Testament. We have this final word, and we've, we're told in Hebrews, it's God's last word. He's not going to add anything else. This is his final word in his son. And since we have access to that, we don't need anyone to give up, stand up, and say a new word from God. We don't need that because we have the words from God in our hands. Things have changed. But here's how he, all, he, he had them handle this. Everything done in worship is to be edifying. I want you to look, look at verse 3 of chapter 14. On the, on the other hand, the one who prophesies speaks to people for their upbuilding, encouragement, and consolation. This word is edification. We are to be edified in the worship service. Now, what does that mean? The next screen is going to explain this just a little bit. In this chapter, as Paul's talking about it, when a person speaks in worship, anything done in worship must be able to be, do all these things right here. Number one, it's spoken to people. It is to build up or to encourage or to console the hearer. It must be understandable. You've got to be able to understand it. Number four, you must be able to say amen to it. Yes, I got the message and I acknowledge it's true, so I, I'm able to process it and not just understand it, but I'm able to process it in my mind. And then number five, it must be able to convict. I get a response, a reaction from it. Edification, therefore, means, next screen, whatever is done in our worship must be able to convey truth so others can understand it and benefit from it. Edification must be understandable. It is not just an emotional reaction. Now, I know we get a lot of uh, accusation of this over the years that we had no emotions in our worship and we're all rational, and I understand all that. But you know what his major complaint with the tongue speakers was? It got everybody emotionally riled, but it told them nothing when they didn't have an interpreter. To get a whipped into a frenzy emotionally, but not have any substance or content is not fit for public worship. This is not about us riling each other up emotionally. This is making sure we understand truth. Then, notice that conviction one, then once you have the truth, all the sorts of emotions flow from it. It is fine for us to express emotion. We need to more, church. There's no reason not to. How can you sing? When I survey the wondrous cross and you be singing those words that you totally understand and not feel it in your heart for what Jesus did for you. How can you listen to what Thomas talked about at the Lord's Supper this morning and not feel touched deeply by what you heard? But do not come at me and try to whip up my emotion with something that doesn't have truth. Don't just bring something in here to try to whip up emotion and stuff that has nothing to do with something I understand. What would I liken that to in Christianity? today I read about this and some people are wanting to put dance into worship dance I'm trying to think about how I could put dance in worship just process that in your mind for a minute little twirl a little tap dance a little ballet I have no idea why you'd want to put that in worship now, if your daughter does this, don't get offended at me. But I got to tell you, I've never been invited to a dance recital for anybody. And if I don't know who's there, there's no way on earth I'd go to that. I can't get my hour back on Saturday from that. I just can't. Uh, there, I do not see what you get out of this. And so this lady comes across the stage and does this thing. And everybody goes, oh, I feel worshipful. Really? What did that do for you? It's like abstract painting. I, I look at that and, and you're supposed to get whatever meaning you want out of it. It's up to the eye of the beholder. 
God and His Word was consistent. He never leaves His truth up to the eye of the beholder. He doesn't leave it to us to get truth out of abstract things. He knows He can't trust us. We are too ignorant for that. He says the only thing that needs to be in worship is stuff that's understandable, clear, and benefits you. That doesn't... I'll tell you another thing that doesn't is instruments. There's nothing done with an instrument that gives me a message at all to edify and build up. It does work behind the words to kind of do something emotionally, but it does nothing to contribute to my understanding of God so that I can say amen and feel conviction. It doesn't do that. It does that in concerts, and I love going to them. This is not a concert. This is different than anything else. And so that's one of those things I think it's struck down a little bit by this edification. Whatever's done in worship must be something that conveys a truth that I can receive, benefit from, feel the conviction of, and know God greater than when I did before. That's the only thing that can appear in worship, according to Paul. Which is why he doesn't like tongue speaking. It leaves too much up to the imagination unless there is an interpreter present. That's observation number three. Observation number four. While demanding that everything that needs to be understood, he also says we must engage our minds and our spirit. Look at chapter 14. We're going to add two more elements of worship here that Paul says. Verse 15. What am I to do? I will pray with my spirit, but I will pray with my mind also. I will sing praise with my spirit, but I will sing with my mind also. What makes worship worship is what you do, but more than that, it's what you're doing while you're doing it. I am engaging my mind with what's happening. Right now, if you are still listening, you're engaging your mind. And if you are still, if you're pondering what all this means for your life and what difference it makes, and you're thinking about it, it's engaging your spirit too, and you're worshiping. You might be present this morning, yes or no? You think this is true? You might be here this morning in worship, but not worshiping. Is it possible? If your mind is engaged but your spirit isn't, you're not worshiping. If your spirit is engaged but your mind's not, you're not worshiping. If you are here and you're not doing any of that, you're not worshiping. If you are here and two people can be here, that's Steve back there, Glenn over here, two people looking at me at the same time, we are all together doing something, but they, one of them's worshiping and one of them's not. Is that possible? Very much so. But the point about this one is, singing and praying you do in worship, and you do it, and it is worship, if you're engaging your mind and your spirit. It can do one or the other. It can't make you emotionally have a reaction, but it not be me mentally engaging. It cannot. You must include both of them for it to be worship. So singing and praying were part of the worship back then. Fifth observation comes at the end of chapter 14, where he tells a bunch of people to shut up. Now, you parents are going to tell me you shouldn't say that, but that's what the Greek word literally says. And so I feel like I'm powered by the actual Holy Spirit, not the King James, to tell people to be quiet. Now, chapter 14. Here's why he's doing it. Have you ever watched Fox News or CNN and they've got um, four experts on a particular topic like Trump? They've got four Trump experts up there and they don't agree. And they're not polite and they don't go one at a time and they're all just blah, 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 blah. And, and, and you're watching this and it just makes you anxious. Blah, 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 all this going on at the same time. You can't understand because they're fighting each other. and it becomes, That's what a Corinthian worship service looked like. That right there. It's a cacophony of sound. Gary, what do you think? Anybody know what cacophony means? That's a Gary James word. Look it up on Google. It just means there's so much sound going on at the same time you can't hear anything. And that's what this worship service looked like. So in verse 27, he says to them, those of you who are speaking in tongues and have an interpreter, one at a time you speak. They were all going at once. Blah, 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 blah. And, they, and the prophet would get up, blah, blah, blah. And, and nobody could understand anything. So tongue speakers, hush! And go one at a time. Now, it's time for the prophets. Hush! One at a time. One at a time. Not all this together at once. 
And then to the women in verse 34. Hush. Quit asking questions. Now, don't ask me to interpret that. I'm just going to leave that there. I got to go home, right? So I'm just going to leave it there. Women, I want you to, uh, to hush. That's male spiritual leadership here, and I don't want you to interact. I don't want you b being involved in interruption of that. The idea is that there was so much sound, nobody was hearing anything. And he applied theology to this. Our God is a God of order and peace. King James Version, we used to quote each other, you know. Uh, it must be done decently and in order. But that's the way God is. He expects order. If you've ever been to, and this is not to offend anybody, but if you've ever been to a more Pentecostal, type service somewhere. I've been to a tent meeting before um, and I ran screaming. This Campbellite wimp just went screaming away from this tent meeting. There was so much stuff going on and so many people praying at the same time. I just, it just made me anxious. I'm not equipped to be able to do that. And, and, and it was all like that. And so that's the way the Corinthian church was. And Paul says, our God is a God of order. Do it decently. Because if people cannot gain understanding, you've just wasted your time. Let's do this orderly and peaceful. So we are somewhat considered kind of boring people because we don't have a whole lot going on here. Oh, there's a whole lot going on here. There's a final observation I want us to make in chapters 15 and 16. It's preaching and giving. At the end of this, he says, I want you to preach. I want you to preach resurrection. And I want you to know that that's the reason you have something to preach that's true. So preach, preach, preach. Chapter 15 and chapter 16. Take up that offering every week so that when I come through and need to take that up and give it to the people who need it, that it'll be ready. So preaching and giving kind of round out the rest of their worship service. What I want you to observe from this so far is from this Corinthian correction. Paul comes along and he says, our worship service is comprised largely of the Lord's Supper and singing and praying and preaching and giving and doing it in such an order that people can be edified. They can learn something from worship. We are largely rational for a reason because we serve a God who's largely rational and wants people to understand. And when we can understand truth, then we can feel it. And the peace that results from that is legitimate. We don't want people to have peace who shouldn't have peace. Peace. We want people to have peace who know truth, and by obeying truth, you can have peace, and there the emotion comes, and it can flow freely. It can, and it should. And we believe they should be able to hear it. All this stuff about being able to hear and fixing the microphones and all that stuff, that's not just goofiness and not just us being particular. We believe in the value of hearing. People should be able to hear. First step in the five steps of salvation is hear. And if people can't hear, they can't do the rest of it. And that's why we're here to be able to hear and know what's going on. Now, that's not all I want to say about this. If you've got your bulletin, I want you to pick it up, if you would. You'll see that note on Wednesday nights. No more assembly time. This, this room, I guess, will be permanently dark, I guess, on Wednesday night. Announcements will be made in the classroom. Prayers will be offered in the classroom. And then when the classroom time is done, you can mill around and talk to each other, but there'll be nothing else in here. But that's not why I'm having you turn to this. Hebrews 10 was read a moment ago because here's the other thing I want to stress about our worship time. Every other thing that's similar to this is different. In the world, you go to concerts and you sit back and you hear what's being done and you evaluate whether you liked it or not. And when you watch TV and reality TV, you, you watch that dance or you watch that performer or you watch that magician or that singer and then you sit and evaluate whether you like it or not and you may call in if you really like these people. That's kind of our cultural background. And when you come into church, the tendency is to bring that cultural understanding of what this is with you. And then if we continue to carry that when we walk out of here, at lunchtime we'll evaluate. Well, let's see. How did Matt do with that singing this morning? Did he sing good this morning? Well, I don't know. I thought he was kind of blah, 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 blah. And there's our critique. And there's our cultural background telling us what we're supposed to do about this worship. What do we think about the, the sermon? Most of the time you'll say, that's the best sermon I've ever heard in my life. That's what you'll say around your lunch table. And you'll talk about that. How did he preach to me and all this stuff? That is not 
what you're here for. What you're here for is unlike anything else you experience in your life. You have no categories for understanding that. You are not a spectator evaluating what participants are doing. When you come into this building, really, Terry at his door and Randy at his door should hand you a little sheet that has a checklist that looks like this one on page two of your bulletin. Your worship to-do list. You have three jobs to do. This is, you guys are not sitting there evaluating and critiquing. Your job is to do something. You're responsible for doing something right now. Number one from Hebrews chapter 10 is you draw near to God. He's invited you into his presence. You are a guest who's here to offer your praise to your God who's done all sorts of good things for you. And so you're drawing near to God and he's given you these five things. There are others throughout scripture, but these five things... He's given you these as tools. I'm, I'm welcoming you into my presence and I'm letting you draw near. Use these things to draw near. As long as you engage your mind and your spirit, you can draw near. This is not, a, this is not like an elevator. We take a group rate and go into the presence of God. You have to choose whether you will or not. Some of you, after you leave this morning, will feel like you've drawn closer to God. You're going to go home and you say, I just feel like God's presence was there. And the reason is your mind and your spirit were engaged and you did exactly what God asked you to do and you by invitation drew into his presence some of you are going to go and say that did nothing for me you didn't worship and I'll tell you whose fault that is this is brazen it's yours preacher can't make you elders can't make you no one can make you worship it can be the best sermon, and listen, it can be the worst. And you still entered the presence of God and were changed. It could. It's up to you. So your critique is not about me or Matt or anybody else here. Your critique is about what you did, whether you took advantage or not. Draw near. Number two, you review what you believe. Your beliefs, what you really believe, because the world is preaching us its doctrine all week long. You come in here to be reminded, what do I really believe? What is eternal? What is really true? I, I don't know about out there, but in here, this is where you, and so you grab onto these truths. We sing them, and we pray them, and we preach them, and we talk about them in Bible class to offset the world's message. That's happening even as we speak right now. And number three, you spur on fellow believers. Now, a couple of things. You can't do this at home. I hear people say this all the time. I can worship at home. You cannot do these things at home. You cannot. Now, if you have a church assembled at your house, that's one thing. I'm talking about you as a person. Cannot do this alone at home. In fact, I think we should have a sign up right up here. It says, don't try this at home. You can't do this stuff. Now, I mean, I know you can pray to God at home like that, but Lord's Supper with your fellow brothers and sisters, how do you spur on each other when you're sitting in the recliner at home and the rest of them are assembled here? How do you spur one another on? This cannot be done alone. This, this takes a community. That's why you're here. Now, another thing that's interesting about spurring on, can you do that by walking in here at the last minute and sitting in here and leaving at the first possible moment? How can you spur people on when you sneak in and out trying not to talk to anybody? Actually, it is possible. There are some of you that it takes everything you've got, and I've talked to a couple of you this week and you know who I'm talking about. It takes everything you've got to get yourself here. You may not say a word to anybody else and you leave and that's all you could do. And I gotta tell you something. I see you and you have blessed me today just by seeing you. I know what an effort it was for you to get here. And I look at you and I go, I know it took every bit of what you got to get here and you don't say a word to me, that's fine. I saw you. That blesses people. Listen, when I walk out here, I may not get around to talking to you and seeing you, but I get a pretty good bird's eye view of everybody. And I'm probably not going to get back there to Jean right now. I'm probably not going to get her before she leaves, but I see her and I can't tell you what that does because I know what it took for her to get here. 
Anybody else have people like that? I'm telling you, your presence here spurred us on. So listen, you got a job to do. You pick up this list when you come in the door and say, this is my job. I've got a job to do. It's not to evaluate and critique. It's to participate and be brought into the presence of God and find somebody there who needs a word from me to hang on to their faith. We need each other. And if some of you disappear, it's going to hurt us. Bad. Hurt us. So spur each other on. One last thing. We come here boldly, but we come here reverently. There is a tone that is to match the believer, or to be exemplified in the believer, and there's a reverence. Whatever it takes for you to have that reverence. But when I think about what's happening in this room as we do this, God comes down to sins, we're drawn into his presence. I'm sitting here wondering, how can people just mill around out there and not want to be in here? Happens a lot. I think we need to be careful with our dress sometimes. We've gotten a little lazy. I'm just going to go as I am. Listen, this is a reverent thing. And I'm not telling you that you can't dress down and be reverent, but I'm going to tell you something. Something more is happening here than just a casual trip to Walmart. It needs to be reflected in the way that we act with each other in here. I'm not giving any rules. I don't, I'm not interested and I don't know your heart. You know your heart. I'm just saying, evaluate yourself. Am I properly reverent? Do I really think something's happening here? One last thing. I want you to see the five steps down here. I did this about the guitar. I kind of like a guitar string. And then Keely, who loves to correct me, says, guitars have six strings. Anyway, imagine a five-string guitar. This is your spiritual life. And if you've got all five strings going, it sounds really good. But you start feeling weak as these strings start to pop. I want you to go ahead and put all five of them up there if you would. And here's what happens. Your spiritual life, if it's in tune and you're doing, you're living right with God, it's, it's making quite a wonderful sound, right? But if you're not careful, these strings start to break and all of a sudden you're going to find that you don't have a spiritual life at all. And I want to tell you why worship is so important, okay, real quickly with this. The five strings, the first one is you quit attempts at reading scripture. So you're at home and you're like, oh, I know I should read scripture, but you just can't get yourself to actually do it. You can't find the time for it. You just don't have the interest in it. And so suddenly there goes one string ding, and now you got four strings left you can do fine your spiritual life with four strings but look at the second one you no longer even consider the extra church stuff that's offered you come in here and you sit on Sunday morning but you don't do anything else no Bible class no fellowship stuff there's other things that could be doing there's other things called out for you to be able to participate in but you choose now I've done enough I've done just enough and now that's all ding there goes another string because these are great events that strengthen your life you get three strings strings left you can still play third string you find it more difficult to pray and you don't but if you do it's so superficial it's like ditto ding now I'm not going to tell you this is not scientific this is my stuff so it may be totally inaccurate for you but I'm going to tell you this mostly goes in chrono chronological order while you've missed these three, these last two are still going on. But then suddenly you start to lose ground in even trying to submit to God's will in areas of your life. You are trying to take care of that language. You're trying to take care of that impatience that you have and that anger that you have. And you, and you really are working at it. And then one day you decide, I don't care anymore. I'm just impatient. God, God, accept me the way I am. Ding! There goes the other string and there's one left. You're still going to public worship. But you're hanging on by a string. And if this one breaks, your spiritual life is gone. It goes in this order. Now, I want you to just play with me for a minute. If things go in this order like this, and I'm an elder here, a preacher here, and I'm looking around, and I'm thinking... I want to keep tabs just a little bit. I want, to, I want to try to remember who all's been here because if you start missing two out of four, three out of five, your church attendance starts breaking. What I can assume is if you're struggling coming to church, you've already given up the first four. Those are already gone. And the only thing you've got left is this worship service and you're hanging on by a string. And as we as elders are looking at this, if you really believe this, if we really believe this, we're looking at it, hey, uh, the elders get together and hey, this guy's missed five out of seven. 
He's, he's, he's on the verge of giving up his faith completely. we got to pay attention to this. Elders, I'm going to put it on you. Pay attention to who's here and who's not. They're crying out, and we're not listening. They've already lost their strength in these other areas, and there's one thing left, and if that's waning, you need to pay attention, and your elders need to love you enough to come to, to you and say, listen, we've noticed this. Is there anything we can do? This is why we stress worship so much. It's the only visible gauge. I cannot tell by looking that your prayer life's vacant. I can't tell by looking that your scripture, your love for scripture is gone. I can't tell by looking that you're no longer trying to live in submission to God. I can't see that by looking, but I can see whether you're here or not. It's the only gauge we got. God forgive if we don't use it to keep the pulse of the church registered. And I want to be able to say, I'm not right now, but I want to be able to say, if you start giving us the symptom that you are f you're losing your faith and we start seeing it, that you're not here at worship, somebody's going to be at your door. I'm not sure that's true. But I am sure, elders, it should be. I am sure of that. Preachers, it should be. This is why worship is important. We put a lot of stock in this, and people say, what's the big deal whether I go or not? It's a big, big deal because of what's happening here. Or not. This is the truth. So here's what I'm wanting to say. You're here so you have a spiritual health that is wonderful and refreshing and you're sharing it and it becomes contagious and that's why we need to be together. I need to see people who value this like me and we, we as iron sharpens iron so one man sharpens another. So hey, let's, let's shake hands and sharpen each other, right? And I, I gotta tell you this, be back tonight, okay? We're gonna do the same thing and then Wednesday we're gonna get a pick me up and next Sunday morning be right back here, okay? We're gonna be right back here to draw near to God and to remember what we believe and to spur one one another on until the Lord comes you can count on me to spur you on and I want to count on you to spur me on and let's just make that commission right there this is the reason why we at the church on the hill the Valley View Church of Christ stress worship so much and we will until the Lord says I don't want worship anymore except in my presence and he comes and he gets us to take us home which I hope is this week but until then Let's serve this way for each other. If you are spiritually weak, if you've never responded and you have no spiritual life at all, this morning is a time to say, I want to take on Christ in baptism and I want to be a child of God. And we'd love to see that. If you've done that, but you feel the weakness, the strings are breaking. You're barely hanging on and you need the prayers of this church. We are ready as a church to receive that prayer and make that prayer. Receive you and make that prayer for you. And not just make the prayer, but to partly be the prayer and be here for you. You need a response to this worship this morning? Please make it as we stand and sing to encourage you. God is so good.